Euthanasia, there's no hope of ever getting well. You're in bad shape. There's one escape because life's become a living hell. Hey, here's a fun topic. Death. Who doesn't love talking about death? I know I sure don't. Death sucks. I'm anti-death. I'll take that brave stand right now with no apology. But the thing is, sometimes life sucks too. Sometimes life sucks so much that death becomes a preferable alternative. When that happens, the question becomes, what should we do about it? When a person has been diagnosed with a terminal illness from which there is no realistic chance of recovery, or has suffered a grievous injury that has left them with an intolerably poor quality of life, does that person have a right to choose death? Should they be able to ask a physician, or perhaps even just a friend, to help them bring about their death? Is it ever appropriate to end the life of a suffering person without their consent? These are questions which we probably all think about, and which some of us have actually had to answer in our own lives, and like many other issues of importance in our society, these are also questions that have been explored many times in many different ways on that popular science fiction show you've seen me talk about in many videos. Videos like this one that you're watching right now, in which I'll look for the answer to a question of my own. What does Star Trek actually say about euthanasia? Various forms of euthanasia, voluntary and involuntary, are referred to throughout Star Trek's history. In the Star Trek The Original Series episode, A Taste of Armageddon, for example, two warring planets practice a form of mass ongoing euthanasia, where their citizens voluntarily allow themselves to be disintegrated as casualties in the war, which is carried out via computer simulation. But that's not what we typically think of when we hear the word euthanasia. That term is usually discussed in more of a medical context. The first time we actually see an act of euthanasia that most of us would recognize as such depicted on screen comes in Star Trek V The Final Frontier. We see it in the form of a memory conjured by the villain Cybok in an attempt to turn Dr. McCoy to his side. His, we all have a secret pain, share it with me gimmick. You've seen the movie. McCoy's father is an old man lying on a bed. McCoy sits by his side, tries to comfort him, but his father is sick and hurting and he whispers to his son, I can't stand the pain. Stop the pain. Help me. Release me, son. So Dr. McCoy does. He deactivates his father's life support system and allows him to pass away peacefully. This apparently happened a little while ago in McCoy's life because Cybok says that the pain from it has poisoned his soul for a long time. The difficulty McCoy has in making the decision is framed as a conflict between his duties as a doctor and his duties as a son. A doctor would preserve life, but a son would do the compassionate thing and allow the suffering of his father to end. That model, with the doctor on the side of life no matter what, and the afflicted person and or their friends and family on the other side, also defines the central conflict of an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation from a few years later, where this subject is the main subject. That episode is part of TNG's fifth season, and it's called Ethics. Jordy and Worf are in the cargo bay trying to track down a chemical leak. Jordy has just confessed to Worf that he uses his visor to cheat at cards when the leaky barrel, which is up on a high shelf, buckles and the barrel stacked on top of it falls and lands right on Worf. Ouch! Cut to Worf waking up in sickbay a short while later, seemingly feeling okay. He tries to get out of bed, but can't. At first, he thinks Dr. Crusher has a restraining field turned on, but Crusher's like, oh, that's not a restraining field, that's the permanent lower body paralysis from when that barrel crushed your spine. Crusher doesn't expect Worf to ever fully recover. His injury is too serious even for imaginary future magic medicine to treat. A few days go by, and Riker pays Worf a visit. Riker tells him, hey man, you look good, and listen, I just want you to know that you don't need to be embarrassed with me, okay, because there's no shame in being injured. Worf's like, thanks. Hey, will you kill me? Riker's like, what? Worf says, well, 
technically I'd do the killing, I just need you to bring me the knife. There's this Klingon seppuku thing I can do now that my spinal cord is snapped like a piece of dry spaghetti. I just need you to hand me the knife and stand here and watch and then pull the knife out when I'm done. So what do you say? Riker says, well, I'm going to go ahead and say hell no to that for now, but I'll think about it. So Riker goes and talks to Picard about it, and he's like, Worf wants me to help him check out early, and I know it's a part of his culture and all, and I pride myself on never looking down on other cultures, but I think it's gross and his culture is dumb. Picard's like, he ain't walking again, though. And Riker says, no, but that doesn't mean his life is over. His injury isn't fatal. He's not even in pain. He could still live a long life, but he wants to swerve onto the exit ramp because, what, he'll never walk again? Since when is walking all that great? I hate walking. Picard says, look at it this way. Worf asked for your help because you're his friend and he thought he could count on you. Consider that as you make your decision. You're his friend too. Maybe you could do it. I'm busy that day. While Riker takes some time to decide whether or not to help Worf chop his own head off or whatever, another doctor, Toby Russell, a neurologist who specializes in spinal injuries, comes aboard the Enterprise, and she has some outside-the-box ideas for how to fix Worf, including, at the top of the list, just 3D print him a new spine. Crusher's not enthusiastic about that, since the survival rate is pretty low, so they try something else first. They strap these bands around Worf's legs that are supposed to help the signals get from his muscles down there to his brain. The band allows Worf to give his leg a jerk, but that's not good enough for him, so he rips the band off and says, no thank you. Crusher says, don't give up, Worf. With some luck and a lot of hard work, devices like this could eventually allow you to regain 60% of your mobility. Worf's like, help me out, math was never my subject. 60% is less than 100%? Yeah, that's what I thought. No, thank you. Russell pitches Worf the 3D printed spine replacement, and he seems interested. But Crusher pulls Russell aside like, I thought we said Ixne on the Une Einspe? Russell says, yeah, I know, but if we do it and it works, Worf gets to fully recover. And if we do it and it doesn't work... Worf wants to off himself now anyway, so what's the problem? Why can't I try some shit? Later, Picard drops in on Crusher on his way to see Worf, and Crusher's like, Oh, Worf, do not get me started. He's being such a baby about his debilitating, life-changing injury. And Dr. Russell telling him about her spine replacement surgery didn't help either. Picard says, why not let her try the spine replacement? If he can't make a complete recovery, he's just going to eat a phaser eventually. So what have you got to lose? Crusher still refuses. She tells Picard that allowing Worf to euthanize himself is unacceptable. And so is the spine replacement surgery, which is basically the same thing as euthanasia because the survival odds are so low. Worf is alive, the doctor insists. He can live a very full life with his injuries. There are more conventional therapies that can help him recover, not all the way, but enough to restore much of his mobility. Picard tries to convince Crusher to allow the surgery by reminding her of the weight carried by Worf's Klingon beliefs, but she doesn't seem persuaded. For her, the fact that Worf is not terminal and not in pain is the bottom line. Riker, on the other hand, has come to a slightly different decision. He returns to Worf's room and tells him, you know what? I've given this a lot of thought. I researched this ritual of yours, and I gotta say, I hate it. And I hate all the Klingon honor bullshit that surrounds it, and I think you're an asshole for even asking me to do this, and also, you're really gonna upset your friends if you do this, and maybe you shouldn't be so selfish, huh? But you know what? I'm your friend, and despite everything I just said, I think I could see my way to helping you out. Thank you, Commander. It means a lot that I can depend on you, too. That is, if it were my place to help you out. Because... Oh, Jesus. In my research, I discovered that it is, in fact, not my place to help you out with this. That duty falls first to the oldest son, which in your case would be your only son, your awful son, Alexander. No, dude, he's the worst. He'll just screw it up in some preposterous yet inevitable way. Damn, Worf, that sounds like a YP. Your problem. Oh, Alexander! Alexander comes in. Worf's like, ugh. I guess I'll get the surgery. Picard's appeal to Crusher must have worked, because she decides to allow the spine replacement. The day of the surgery arrives, Worf asks Troy to raise Alexander if he doesn't make it. 
Troy's like, okay, but please, please don't die. Then, in a really mean prank on Troy, Worf dies on the operating table, leaving the poor woman believing she's now stuck parenting his hopeless loser of a kid. But wait! It turns out Klingons have a built-in system restore feature. Worf lives, and his new spine works. Just as soon as he comes up with another excuse to send Alexander back to live with his parents on Earth again, he's going to be just fine. Ethics is a very good episode that does an excellent job of presenting several different perspectives on euthanasia. While I do find the attitudes displayed by both Dr. Crusher and Commander Riker to be a little out of character, both for themselves as individuals and for the supposedly enlightened society of which they are products, their reactions to Worf's injury and his desire to end his life reflect the opinions a lot of real people hold on the subject. Crusher is right. People who have injuries similar to Worf's do go on to lead full lives. The disabilities that result from such injuries can be severe, more severe even than those experienced by Worf, but they can be accommodated. And in many, many cases, life goes on for people with spinal injuries. That part of Crusher's reaction to Worf's situation makes sense. What doesn't make sense is her, he's not allowed to end his own life, I don't give a shit what he wants attitude. I'm not saying she should enthusiastically support Worf's desire to check out early, but it does feel a little wrong for her to be so dead set against it and so willfully dismissive of the personal and cultural factors at play. Ultimately, it is Worf's life. And whether Crusher agrees with it or not, continuing it or ending it should be up to him, shouldn't it? As for Riker, I love Riker. He's one of my favorite characters, but Riker doesn't really come across very well in this. Again, I get it. A lot of people feel the way Riker feels about what Worf wants to do, but I would hope if any of us are ever faced with a friend or a loved one who is contemplating ending their life for whatever reason, that we would not respond by guilt-tripping them by telling them how devastating their death would be to the people who love them, by calling them selfish, which Troy also does at one point. Not cool. Understandable from a certain perspective, and not uncommon, but still, not cool. Worf's desire to end his life is a response to sustaining a serious injury, but there are other reasons why a person might choose to be euthanized, reasons other people might find even more difficult to understand than Worf's. What if the primary motivation isn't irreparably compromised or declining health, but tradition? What if ending one's own life before a natural death is simply how things are done in one's society? We get a glimpse of such a society in an earlier TNG episode from Season 4. This episode is called Half a Life, and it's not only an excellent episode, it's also an episode that guest stars Majel Barrett as Loaxana Troy, and you won't hear me use excellent and Loaxana Troy to describe any other episodes, because this is the only episode where both apply. I know a lot of you like one or two of her Deep Space Nine episodes, so let me say that again. This is the only episode where both apply. The episode opens with a bone-chilling warning from Counselor Troy in the form of a voiceover from her personal log, where she states, My mother is on board. It is a good episode. It is. That just now, that was an involuntary response. Like a gag reflex for existential dread. Anyway, the Enterprise has arrived at the planet Kalon 2 to pick up that world's leading scientist who is working on a project of the utmost importance, a method of rejuvenating their dying son. And Loxana is along because the Enterprise passed by her home planet on the way, and she thought it would be fun to make the lives of her daughter and her co-workers miserable for a few days. By this point in the series, the writers of TNG had mostly abandoned coming up with specific justifications for Loaxana's presence on the ship. She's just there. Her occasional visitations, a random product of a capricious universe, a scourging which the crew of the Enterprise and we in the audience must periodically endure. Timison, the aforementioned leading scientist of Kalon 2, arrives aboard the Enterprise to test his sun revitalization process. Helium fusion enhancement, he calls it like stem cell therapy for a star. 
Another star, a close match to the Kalon Sun, has been located, so Timison is going to shoot that star with a special torpedo to see if his process works. And if it does, they'll do the same thing with the Kalon Sun, and everybody's happy. Sound good? Good. Now let's get to... Oh, here comes the Waxana. She attaches herself to Timison as soon as he beams in, and always seems to appear whenever he's in the middle of some very important work. She's on the bridge when he emerges from a meeting with some of the senior officers and tries to get him to drop whatever he's doing and pay attention to her. He begs off something about preventing the death of his planet's son. And Riker, my hero, very kindly tells Loaxana to get her unauthorized ass off the bridge. But Timison watches her go and seems kind of taken with her. Poor guy. Picard mentioned that Kalon 2 was a very private world and its people reclusive, so I figured Timison doesn't really get out much, but finding Luoxana Troy appealing? I had no idea it was that bad. That night, after bullying Timison and Geordi and Data into having a picnic in engineering, Luoxana invites Timison into her quarters, but he declines. He obviously likes her, and he's available. He tells her that his wife is dead, which is like waving a raw steak in front of a starving Doberman. But for some reason, he's holding back. The Enterprise arrives at the test star, and they shoot the star with Timison's helium ignition torpedo, and everything works great until it doesn't, and the star explodes. So I guess they'd better not try that on the Kalon Sun. Timison is deeply upset by the failure and expresses his gratitude to Captain Picard and the crew. Later, Loaxana finds Timison sitting alone in Ten Forward and tries to comfort him by actually behaving like a decent human being for once, instead of a pushy, self-centered, boundary-ignoring, obnoxious irritant. And Timison takes her hand and tells her he wishes he'd met her a few years ago, because the thing is, now that the experiment is over and his helium ignition process is a failure, he's going home to die. The custom on Kalon 2, you see, is for people to end their lives when they reach the age of 60, which Timison is about to do. He was hoping the test of his helium ignition torpedo would be a success so he could meet his end knowing his society would live on, but now that's not going to happen. Loxana objects, first to Captain Picard, who couldn't do anything about it even if he wanted to because of the Prime Directive, then to Timison himself, who tries to explain that this is the way of his world, and that the end-of-life ceremony, which they call the resolution, is a beautiful thing and allows people to die with dignity and pass the torch to the next generation without becoming a burden to their families. Loaxana, who, and I cannot possibly stress this enough, is the worst, says, well, what about the responsibility children have to care for their aging parents? We see to their needs all our lives, and eventually it's their turn to take care of us. When Timison quite reasonably points out that parents should not expect to be paid back for the love they give their children, Loxana retorts, well, why the hell not? Why does anybody like her? She's awful. She's awful. And not in a compelling, scheming, villainous, she's the one you love to hate, Kai Win sort of way either. She's just a terrible person. She does make a few good points, though, in there amongst all her bullshit. For example, she challenges Timison on the age selected for the resolution. Why 60? What about people like him who are still healthy and vital at that age and could go on to live many more years? What about others who develop serious illnesses at much younger ages? Do they have to wait until they're 60? Isn't that cruel? Timmis encounters that forcing families to decide for themselves when to terminate the lives of their elders is what would truly be cruel, which is why they established a standard age for the resolution. It's not perfect, but it's for the best, and it's the custom of his people, and he has no intention of going against it. Finally, Loaxana pulls out the big guns. What about your planet? She asks him. You're the greatest scientist on your world, and your son is dying. What if those who take over your work are unable to find the answer, but you could have? What if any hope of a future for your world, for your grandchildren, dies with you? Timison is obviously moved by what Loaxana is saying, but still not convinced. Later, though, he's in engineering going over the results from the failed test, and he notices something. 
he discovers the reason the test failed, a reaction the star had which he hadn't anticipated. This kind of reaction could be corrected for theoretically, but developing a practical method to do it could take years. Years Timison doesn't have. Now, with a specific, promising possibility to save his world, Timison makes a fateful decision. He will defy the resolution. He will live on and continue his work. He meets with Captain Picard and officially requests asylum aboard the Enterprise. The government of Kalon II doesn't take this very well. When Timison informs them of his decision, they send out a squadron of attack ships with orders to fire on the Enterprise unless Timison is returned to the planet. And when Timison tries to convince them by transmitting the new analysis of the test result, they block the transmission and terminate the link between the Enterprise and their computers, cutting Timison off from his work. As if all that wasn't discouraging enough, Timison's daughter comes aboard. Oh, she looks like a troublemaker. Keep an eye on her. Dara, Timison's daughter, pleads with him to come home. It's time for him to put his work down and rest, she says. If he doesn't come home, where will he go? Where will he die? Where will he be laid to rest? On some other world far from his family? How can he live on knowing that will be his fate? How can he stand knowing that his life will become an insult to his people and everything they believe in? During this painful, heartfelt scene between parent and child, Loaxana ingratiates herself to Dara by calling the resolution a custom which obviously means a great deal to Dara and Timison, quote, an obscene ritual. Because even in this, by far her best episode, she's still utterly insufferable most of the time. Dara leaves, Timison asks Loaxana to leave him alone too, and later, Timison visits Loaxana in her quarters to tell her that he's changed his mind and he's going home to complete his resolution. He tells the Waxana that he loves her, but that if that is the only reason he has to live, it's not enough. He's like, Waxana, I know what I'm about to say can't possibly make any sense to you, but I don't want to be that selfish. So Timison leaves for his resolution, and Waxana goes with him, promising Picard she won't cause any trouble while she's down there. Yeah, well, that and a dollar will get you a small coffee at Burger King. As with ethics, this episode presents a multifaceted view of the euthanasia slash right to die issue. And even though this is obviously a fictional situation with no direct correlation to reality, so far as I know, there aren't any actual societies that compel all of their citizens to end their lives once they reach a predetermined age, I could be wrong on that. Any cultural anthropologists who know better should feel free to correct me in the comments. Thematically, it matches up to the real thing pretty well. The central tension regarding the resolution ritual is that which exists between the desire to die with dignity and the desire to live as long as possible and make the most of whatever time you have, regardless of the circumstances. Timison's people have decided that it's better for their society as a whole if they just pick an age where everyone dies and that's it. It's similar to the state of affairs on the two warring planets in classic Trek's A Taste of Armageddon, only without the simulated war. And it affects everyone, not just designated casualties. Agree or disagree, the arguments from both sides have some merit. When Timison explains to Loaxana about the origins of the resolution, he tells her of how things were on his planet before when people were allowed to live out their natural lifespans, and those who had no family who could afford to care for them when they grew too sick or weak to care for themselves were sent to hospice facilities where they waited alone to die. They had meant something, Timison says, but they were forced to live beyond that into a time when they meant nothing. That's a powerful statement powerful enough to justify universal state-mandated euthanasia of 60-year-olds? I don't know about that, but powerful nonetheless. On the other side, Loaxana's arguments also make a lot of sense. Everyone ages differently, and 60 years old for one person will not be the same as 60 years old for someone else, nor will any other age. Timison and the Kalon can try to justify it all they want by saying it's about letting people die with dignity and they picked a universal age to make it fair, but the individualized nature of life 
where no one's experience will ever be exactly like another's makes any attempt to choose an appropriate age for everyone to die inherently unfair. And that's not even getting into the question of whether it's ever the right thing for a government to compel or at least strongly encourage its citizens to euthanize themselves. An additional interesting angle shown in Half-A-Life is that Timison's daughter, Dara, guilt trips him using a what about the rest of us appeal very similar to the one Riker and to a lesser extent Troy uses on Worf in Ethics. Only Dara's using it to try to convince her father to end his own life, not to go on living. Nifty little reversal there. So that's two episodes that have dealt with the issue at hand. I'm going to look at one more. There are others I could talk about, but I'm not going to. This is an essay, not a listicle. The last episode I'm going to examine zeroes in a bit tighter on the element of personal choice. In ethics, Worf is motivated to end his life by his accident and paralysis. In Half a Life, Timison is motivated by his culture, but... What about when someone isn't being pushed to the decision by some unexpected circumstance or external factor? What if they've just come to the conclusion on their own that, for them, it's time to go? Should people be allowed that option? That question is at the heart of an episode from Star Trek Voyager's second season, Death Wish. As the episode begins, Voyager has pulled up alongside a comet. This is an encouraging sign. Ancient people considered comets to be bad omens, but in today's modern, more sophisticated era, we know better. A comet showing up in a Star Trek episode means it's going to be a good episode. I don't make the rules. I merely derive them from empirical observation. Anyway, it turns out there's something in the center of that comet, and it's this guy. Q. Not the same Q we've seen so many times before on TNG and that one episode of Deep Space Nine. A different Q. And this cue has, wait for it, a death wish. Within a few minutes of arriving on Voyager, this new cue attempts to end his own life using his powers, but it doesn't work. He accidentally makes all the male crew members of Voyager disappear instead. I bet that feminazi Captain Janeway loves that, though, doesn't she? Woke. Can't believe they made Star Trek woke. It's terrible. New Q can't seem to bring back the men. Fortunately, Q appears. That Q, the real Q. Q classic. And he brings back the men, which unfortunately includes Chakotay. Hey, Q, can you use your powers to make him not be a scab? And can you do Drew Barrymore next? Damn, that was fast. Anyway, New Q is not happy to see Q classic, and he uses his powers to send Voyager away. The two Qs play a game of godlike being hide-and-seek, with New Q taking Voyager to the moment of the Big Bang, shrinking it to subatomic size, and turning it into a Christmas ornament, only for Q classic to find them every time. Faced with the possibility of this omnipotent stalemate going on forever, Janeway calls an end to it and offers to mediate their dispute. That dispute is as follows. New Q wants to end his own life, and Q Classic, speaking for the rest of the Q continuum in this matter, says New Q isn't allowed to do that. This immovable impasse between two all-powerful entities will be settled through that grandest of Star Trek traditions, an arbitration hearing, when we get to watch the future astronauts and aliens who live on and visit inhabited planets located all across the galaxy and travel aboard spaceships that fly at thousands of times the speed of light, resolve their conflicts by sitting around a table and arguing about it. I'm not complaining. Euthanasia is a legal issue as well as a moral one, so it's about time we talked about a courtroom episode. New Q, who is omnipotent and could conjure literally any attorney from any planet, from any point in history to represent him, asks Tuvok to be his lawyer. Because when you produce a series with a regular cast, you use the regulars. So the hearing begins, and Janeway starts by asking New Q the obvious question, How come you want to die, bud? New Q's argument is pretty simple. He should be allowed to live however he wants, even if that means that he wants to stop living. The fact that he's a member of an omnipotent and, generally speaking, immortal race shouldn't make any difference. It's his life. It's now or never. He don't want to live forever. 
Q Classic's counter-argument, which he makes by calling himself to the witness stand, is that new Q being allowed to end his own life would constitute an unprecedented disruption in the Q continuum. No Q has ever ended their own life before. There's no telling what effect it would have on Q society. Furthermore, Q Classic accuses new Q of being mentally unstable, which is another reason he shouldn't be given the right to end his own life. Tuvok responds to both of those points. First, he claims Q Classic is only saying new Q is mentally unstable because he wants to end his own life, which is an insufficient basis. Second, Tuvok reminds Q Classic and the court that the Q Continuum has chosen to execute its own in the past. Ah yes, Q Classic says, but in those cases, the crimes for which they were being punished created the disruption to the Continuum, and their executions ended the disruption. Their deaths preserved the social order. New Q's death by his own hand would threaten it. Furthermore, Q Classic insists, the life of New Q as an individual has had a positive impact on the universe through his interactions with others. Q Classic calls witnesses. Isaac Newton, who attained his crucial insights into the theory of gravity after New Q jostled a tree they'd both been sitting under, causing an apple to fall on Newton's head. Maury Ginsburg, a hippie, whom New Q gave a ride to Woodstock, where Ginsburg was able to save the show by spotting a loose audio cable. And Commander Riker, who learns that he owes his existence indirectly to New Q, since it was New Q who carried one of Riker's ancestors to safety after he was wounded during a battle of the American Civil War. Of which I believe Riker's younger brother was also a veteran. So, New Q's life has meant something. But what will it mean in the future if he is forced to continue it? He'll go right back into that comet where the crew of Voyager found him, where the Q Continuum imprisoned him to stop him spreading his disruptive right-to-die propaganda. What kind of life is that? Not much of one, as New Q demonstrates by transporting himself, Tuvok, Q Classic, and Janeway, inside the comet so they can see for themselves. They return to Voyager, and Janeway says to New Q, look, I'm sympathetic, but typically, a request like yours is only granted if death would also result in the relief of suffering. You suffer from being locked up in a comet, but you're only in there because you want to end your own life. Can you show me some other way in which you are suffering which could justify what you want to do? And New Q says, I sure can! And off to the Q continuum they go! New Q whisks the four of them to the Q continuum, which looks like this. Janeway's like, this is the Q Continuum? New Q says it wasn't always like this. Once, when the Q first reached their present level of evolution, the Continuum was alive with activity. As individual Q explored the universe and discussed and debated, New Q himself was once one of their most influential philosophers. But that's how the Continuum used to be. For the last 10,000 years, it's been a long road. Life is a highway, New Q says, but I no longer want to ride it all night long, or for any length of time. New Q blames the crushing boredom that has smothered the continuum for the misadventures of Q Classic. He says Q Classic started doing whatever he wanted with his powers to entertain himself because there was nothing else to do. And New Q admired that about Q Classic because it was interesting, because it shocked the continuum out of its stupor because it forced them to think. But now, Q Classic has fallen back into line. And here he is, representing the same stodgy old continuum he used to take such delight in defying. I miss the old Q, New Q says. Then, New Q turns to Janeway and says, You asked me to prove to you that I was suffering as though I had some disease. Well, in a way I do. The disease is immortality and I should be able to escape from the suffering caused by it. When life has gone on so long that it becomes pointless, when life itself has become a source of pain, the person living that life should have the right to end it. Ultimately, Janeway agrees and decides in New Q's favor. After deliberations, which include an attempted bribe from Q Classic, who offers to send Voyager straight back to Earth if she sees things his way, classic Q Classic, Janeway rules that, even with the possible repercussions to the Q Continuum, she cannot justify immortality being forced upon someone who doesn't want it. 
Janeway declares that new Q should be made mortal and given the choice to decide whether he wants to live or not. Q Classic grudgingly honors the decision, and new Q is granted his mortality. <laughs> and buddy, he wastes no time in using it. By the very next scene, new Q, who has chosen the name Quinn for himself, has ingested poison hemlock and is like, thanks for the finite lifespan, Captain Janeway, I'm out! There's briefly some confusion as to where Quinn got the poison hemlock, since the doctor doesn't keep it in sickbay, and the ship's replicators aren't programmed to make it. But then Q Classic appears and confesses that he gave Quinn the hemlock, because he admired Quinn's courage and irrepressible spirit, and hopes to prove himself a worthy student. And if the Continuum doesn't like it, they can hit the road. Literally. In a manner of speaking. As I mentioned earlier, the three episodes I've chosen to examine in this video are not the only times euthanasia or the right of a person to end their own life have been subjects of Star Trek stories. If there's one I didn't mention about which you have some thoughts to share, please do so in the comments section. The three episodes I focused on show us the issue from different sides and perspectives, and cumulatively, I think, represent the overall attitude toward this issue expressed by Star Trek over the years. That attitude is best summed up by Quinn's closing argument to Janeway in Death Wish. When life has become unendurable, it must be allowed to end. What it really comes down to is individual liberty, bodily autonomy, the right to choose. That's something the creators of Star Trek have believed in and argued for since the very beginning, and at least one Star Trek icon did more than just believe it and argue for it on principle. When the time came, he put it into practice. In 2015, Leonard Nimoy, the original Spock, the actor who for many fans for many decades was the embodiment of Star Trek, died. Nimoy died from complications of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, a progressive and irreversible condition of the lungs that makes it difficult to breathe, which, in turn, eventually makes it difficult to do anything else. In 2019, Nimoy's widow, actor and director Susan Bay, gave an interview to Inside Edition, where she revealed that Nimoy had sought the intervention of his nurses to assist in bringing about his death. Bay described how the nurses simply gradually increased Nimoy's morphine dosage, and because of how advanced the disease was and the severely compromised state of his health, it didn't take very long. Leonard believed in dying with dignity, Susan Bay said. Life is a sacred thing. It's right that we should cherish it and seek to preserve it, but as we do so, we should never lose sight of the importance of the quality of that life. And no one is in a better position to judge the quality of an individual life than the individual living it. Obviously, we need to be thoughtful and careful about this. Obviously, we need to be willing to intervene if a person attempts to end their own life in a way that is impulsive or a product of depression or some other condition that might be treated and managed and endured. But when a person is suffering and there's no realistic expectation that suffering is going to end or improve and they make the rational, thoughtful decision to end their life, they should be allowed to do that. That's what I believe. That's what Leonard Nimoy believed. And I think that's what Star Trek is saying we all ought to believe. This is the traditional Vulcan salute. It's become synonymous with Star Trek itself. Whether you use it to express solidarity with fellow Trekkies, or greet fellow Trekkies, or make fun of Trekkies, when you throw this baby up, it means Star Trek. And when we give this salute, we also usually say, live long and prosper, a phrase first spoken on screen by Leonard Nimoy as Spock. We don't just say live long, we say live long and prosper. The implication being that a long life of prosperity, of good health, of fulfillment, of meaning, is a gift. Life without those things, well, to some, such a life might not be worth living anymore. That's a choice we should all have the right to make, should we ever find ourselves in that situation. And it's a choice which, when made by others in that situation, we should all respect. Of course, it's sad, but as Spock would say, it is logical live long and prosper. And as Guy Lombardo would say, 
Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Jesse Stutzman, thanks Jesse. Neil Moore, thanks Neil. Michael Lujan Bevacqua, thanks Michael. Jason's Model Shop, thanks Jason's Model Shop. Isaiah Taylor, thanks Isaiah. Iris Artine, thanks Iris. Normally, this is where I'd shout out new channel members, but I don't have any shout outs for new channel members this month. That being the case, if you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects. The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch-along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, we're going to shift our perspective yet again. We're not going to talk about how Star Trek has dealt with a particular issue. We're not going to examine a specific character or group of characters. We're going to pull way out, but we're also going to push in real close at the same time. Like a dolly zoom, but, you know, a rhetorical version. We're going to explore a question that requires us to plunge straight down into the center of this great multimedia sci-fi adventure franchise we all love so much, to find its heart and hold it in our hands and know it and its ways. Sounds pretty epic, right? That question, what makes Star Trek Star Trek? That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.